Hello, I am John Frankie, the theologian in residence at Second Presbyterian Church. And this is the first of six Bible studies uh, that we'll be engaging in over the next few weeks. Um, the series is entitled Sent into the World, Christian Formation for the Mission of God. And we're going to be looking at six texts from the Gospels and uh, reflecting on them and thinking about them with respect to what is the mission of God in the world? What is God up to? How are we called to be participating in it? And what are the ways in which we, as the disciples of Jesus, need to be formed to participate in that fully and effectively? Our first study here is uh, entitled, So I Send You, from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. There are broader instructions on this series in the introductory video, which is also posted online. Uh, I'm going to start by reading the text, and then we're just going to work through it. And uh, you'll have some questions that are also posted online for reflection and study, further study. Here's the text from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. And just to set the context, Jesus has been crucified and has risen from the grave in John's account. This occurs later on that day. And uh, Jesus appears to his disciples. Here's what the text says. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of the Lord. So what we're going to do is just talk through this passage um, briefly. I'd suggest a basic outline. Um, verses 19 through 20 uh, speak of the church in the person of the disciples receiving the shalom or the peace of God through one, the presence of the risen Jesus in verse 19. And second, through the work of the crucified Jesus in verse 20. And then in verses 21 through 23, the church then is called to reflect or imitate or disseminate or pass on shalom into the world through, one, continuing and participating in the work of Jesus, verse 21, through the power of the Spirit, secondly, verse 22, and then third, through the ministry of forgiveness in verse 23. So we're going to walk through this text following that basic outline. So think about the context here. Uh, Jesus has uh, risen from the dead. Uh, Easter is, uh, the first Easter day has occurred. And in the life of the church, we recently celebrated Easter, and we view Easter as the context in which the definitive event in the life of Jesus' ministry on earth, that is, his death and resurrection, takes place. It is the fulfillment of his mission on earth. He says on the cross, remember one of the words, it is finished. But it's also the beginning of the revolution he proclaimed. It's not just an end, it's the end of his specific work on earth, but it's the beginning of a revolution. The good news that he had been proclaiming throughout the Gospels that God's kingdom is at hand. A new world based on the love and forgiveness and peace of God. And it's what happens next on that day 
that we want to look at more closely. Uh, some scholars view the Gospel of John as both communicating the, the ministry of Jesus, but also the constant work of preparing the disciples to continue that. So in the first 12 chapters of John, we get a detailed discussion uh, of Jesus' life and ministry. But then in chapter 13, all of chapters 13 through 17 um, are described by scholars as Jesus' so-called farewell discourse, his final instructions to his disciples, who he knows are going to be the ones to continue his work. They are not ready to hear that yet, but Jesus is preparing them for that reality. Then in 18 and 19 in John's Gospel, those chapters, we get the story of the passion and the death in, uh, of Jesus. And then in 20, we have the resurrection account and then the bringing to fulfillment this work that Jesus has been preparing uh, the disciples for all along. First, we see the presence of the risen Jesus. So we're told in verse 19 that the disciples are locked in a house where they had met, uh, and they're afraid. They're afraid of, uh, it says in the text, the Jews. They're afraid of all of those who are, uh, they fear will be after them. After all, they've been following Jesus. He, their leader, has been crucified and they are worried that the same thing may happen to them. They have dispersed. We know the story is in Peter's denial. Uh, they are living in fear. And it's in this context that Jesus comes into their midst, stands amongst them, amongst them and says for the first of two times in this text, peace be with you. And here's the first point in our outline that um, the presence of the risen Jesus here, standing in the midst of the disciples, is reflective of the church receiving uh, the shalom or the peace that comes from God that is central to God's mission. Peace is one of the major themes throughout the Hebrew scriptures and in the New Testament that uh, Jesus work brings to the world. That's the intention of God. Peace on earth. Not just peace um, in our hearts and souls, though that is important. Not just peace when we die and go to be with the Lord, but peace here and now on earth. And Jesus is announcing that to his disciples um, and communicating that, giving that to the church. The second uh, element of this reception of the shalom of God that we see in this text is the work of the crucified Jesus. Notice what comes next in the text. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So he's showing them that he is the one who was crucified, who was crucified that he bore these injuries, this death on their behalf. And they rejoice when they see the Lord. They know it's him. Uh, he is their leader. He is the one they thought was passed on, but now is alive and in their midst, and they celebrate in that. And it's these two ideas, which we will see throughout um, our study over these next few weeks, that the, it's the peace that comes through the presence of Jesus and also the peace or shalom that comes through the work of Jesus, the things Jesus did ultimately culminating in his death and resurrection. Uh, the biblical scholar N.T. Wright uh, in his book, The Day the Revolution Began, pictures the crucifixion of Jesus as the start of what Jesus intended all along, that Jesus' work so important and crucial is but a prelude to the larger work uh, that God intends. And in fact, in John's uh, gospel, in this farewell discourse in chapters 13 through 18, Jesus even tells his disciples, who must have been stunned at the time, 
that they would do greater things than he has done. And in this context, we can say that that means we, the church, today, throughout history, but today, are called to continue that work of doing even greater things. And that leads us to the second part of the text. If the first part is the disseminate or the reception of the church, the ways the church receives the shalom, the peace of God, through the presence and work of Jesus, it doesn't end there. Now the church in verses 21 and 23 is called to reflect or imitate or continue or extend or disseminate, whatever words you find helpful, this shalom, to continue this. And here we come to the text that is perhaps at the heart of the passage, and maybe even central to the entirety of the Gospel of John. There in verse 21 read, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. The first part of this text uh, speaks of the Father sending Jesus. Some of you may not be aware that the English word mission is actually derived from the Latin words to send or sending. Uh, that sending idea is missio. That's where we get our English word. That means mission in this biblical context means to send and to be sent. So theologically we here we see the sending of the Father. That is, the Father is engaging in mission by sending Jesus. And we also see the sentness of the Son, uh, so that God the Father is sending, God the Son is the one who is sent. And that means that God, in fullness, the fullness of God, is both the sender and the sent. In this context, mission when we talk about the term mission theologically, it's ultimately rooted in the very character and being of God as the one who sends and is sent. And one of the consequences of affirming that mission is, in this technical term, an attribute of God, it's part of the very character and being of God, uh, is that mission, the mission of God, doesn't have an end. It doesn't wrap up with uh, the end of the world or the culmination or the fulfillment of all that God intends, but rather it, it continues in God's life. And it might be worth just thinking about that uh, with whoever you're sharing this with. What, what does mission look like in heaven when sin and rebellion against God are, are no more? but mission goes on. This idea that God is a missionary is captured in the Latin term, missio dei, which means simply mission of God. And it suggests that God in God's very being has a particular concern or an, to engage with the world, that God is not simply neutral, standing off up in heaven or all around us, but neut with a neutral posture, but God is engaged uh, and takes sides. God wants to bring about peace on earth. Uh, this is on display in the gospel accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus. The second phrase is perhaps the most stunning. It's that, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Uh, Jesus transfers the mission that he has been engaged in to the disciples and, by extension, all of his future followers. That's you and I. The church is sent into the world after the pattern by which the Father sent the Son to continue and extend the mission of Jesus. Uh, the great South African uh, missiologist, somebody who studies mission, a man named David Bosch, simply says that what this means is that the classical doctrine of the missio dei, that idea of the mission of God, which is traditionally says the Father sends the Son, and the Son and the Father send the Spirit to continue this work, has to be expanded to include another movement, 
in which Father, Son, and Spirit send the church. And in keeping with this pattern of sending, the mission of the church is intimately connected with the mission of Jesus. Hence, the church is sent into the world to do nothing less than to continue the work of Jesus. And as we've already said, Jesus promised earlier in this same gospel that the church so sent into the world would do even greater things. Now, these next two uh, bits of scripture in our outline, uh, speaking of the this mission continuing in the power of the Spirit and through the minute by the ministry of forgiveness. So uh, the text reads um, that Jesus breathed on them. Let me read it, it exactly. When he had said this, after he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So another striking element that we've talked already about continuing the ministry of Jesus. What does that mean? Here's how tight that, that link is between the mission of Jesus and the mission of the church. It's established in two ways. First, by the gift of the promised spirit. The same spirit who had anointed Jesus for his mission at his baptism at the Jordan now it's this very same spirit that guided and empowered Jesus that will guide and empower the church. So here we have the fullness of the Trinity on display, the Father sending the Son. The Father and the Son sending the Spirit to empower the church in its sentness to continue the work. And second, this link is established by Jesus entrusting to the church the authority that was central to his mission, that is, the authority to forgive sins. The great missional theologian Leslie Newbegin says that the idea here is not simply that God will forgive sins, although that's true, but the specific commission to the church is to do something that otherwise will not be done in the world, namely, to bring the forgiveness of God to actual men and women in their concrete situations in the only way that can be done so long as we are in the flesh, and that is by the word and act and gesture of another human being. This is what we enact in church when we proclaim the forgiveness of God, and then we share the peace because it's this forgiveness that makes possible the gift of God's peace, this restoration of shalom, which is the all-embracing blessing of God and Israel, to Israel, rather. It is this focus of this initial word to Jesus, peace be with you. The church is a movement launched into the life of the world, to bear in its own life God's gift of peace for the world. That it is, the church is sent, you and I are sent, not only to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, but to bear in our own life the presence of that kingdom. From this perspective, the gospel is a message to be proclaimed, this good news, and it's a way of life that provisionally demonstrates here and now the announced reality that even as we wait for the coming fulfilled uh, fullness of the gospel, we are a manifestation of its reality here and now. So we'll conclude with this simple outline, which you can reflect on and talk about, that mission is sentness. It is ongoing participation in the life of God, sharing in God's very life, Father, Son, and Spirit, by participating in the work of God, the work of mission, mission in the world. The mode of mission is Christ-likeness. 
So here's our question that we will explore in the studies ahead. How is Christian formation, or another word for that is discipleship, how does that lead us to be like Jesus? Because that is the mode of mission. The means of mission here in this text is the power of the Spirit. The power of the Spirit enables, just as it enabled, the Spirit enables Jesus to engage in mission, so it enables us. In terms of our formation, how do we grow in our awareness of the work of the Spirit in our life? And finally, the content of mission is that of peace and forgiveness. So we'll talk about, in terms of formation, how do we know peace in our own life through the presence of Jesus and the Spirit and God? How do we experience forgiveness in our own life so that we can be the emissaries of peace and forgiveness in the world. I hope you found these reflections helpful. Uh, there is a sheet uh, that is available online with uh, some questions for reflection, which you can do with those around you, or perhaps form a Zoom group, a small group, to discuss these matters together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this the work of Jesus, and the ways that you have called us to continue that work. We pray that through these times you might strengthen us for that task and form us into the people that you've called us to be as followers and disciples of Jesus so that we can continue uh, that great revolutionary work that you started so many years ago. Make us faithful to that end, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Go in peace.